From the Arkansas Sports Network, it's an in-depth Arkansas Razorbacks podcast featuring the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Brad Caldwell. When I grew up, I remember the Quinn Groby days where the the SWC champions in um, 88 and 89. I mean, that was the time that I grew up. That's the time that I got hooked on Razorbacks. Around here, we call him the Rain Man of Arkansas Razorback Sports, Mr. Duran Miller. Real quick, you know, speaking about going down to the Baton Rouge, you know, uh, and and all the corn dogs and all that nature. But uh, <laughs> y'all remember the Tom Bobby Boucher and his every quarterback and the fans fell off. <laughs> and finally, he wears his hair upside down and he pushes all the buttons, Mr. Bill Harshaw. When you look at the Razorback athletic program across the board, Hunter urichak has got this thing moving in the right direction. Uh, because these kids are looking at Arkansas athletics going, hey, Arkansas is the place to be, and we haven't had that before. Everyone get ready, because you're now connected to The Razor Wire. And welcome into yet another episode of The Razor Wire. Bill Harshaw with you, along with Brad Caldwell and Jaren Miller, as always. And guys, we had a heart-stopping moment Saturday, especially in that first half against Rice. What do you guys thought? Uh, my heart stopped after the the long bomb, the 41 yard touchdown pass, with about eight minutes to go in the third quarter. I guess, man, I don't know, maybe it was a little earlier than that. But um, I thought, man, they're dancing on the sidelines. We're about to lose, um, you know, <laughs> we're about to lose, and all these picks that we made are going to look like a bunch of hillbilly bumpkins picked them. And so <laughs> there's a whole story behind that. Anyway, uh, but I felt like after that, Arkansas woke up and, you know, scored 31 points in the second half, which is the most since 2003 against Mississippi State when they beat them 52-6 to six in the game that I was at. Yeah, I was at that game too. Yeah. That was the last game for uh, their head coach, Jackie Sherrill. Yep. Cedric Cobbs, Jason Peters, Sean Andrews, all that group. That, that was Matt Jones. A lot of fun to watch. That was a good team that year. Um, o for October kept them out of the SEC championship game, but um, you know it. It was really a tale of two halves, and uh, I think there was some positives and some negatives. I don't think you really know anything about the Razorbacks right now. Um, I think we're going to find out on Saturday. Yeah, that was the uh, that was the year that we beat Texas, thirty eight to twenty eight in Texas. Uh, Two thousand three was that same year we beat Mississippi State in that big win. I had the worst seats ever in that game. That uh. It's in that one section on the west side, on the lower section that you get too far and a little, the building comes out and it cuts off the jumbo screen when there was only one screen. And uh, yeah, see, it's, uh, so I learned a lesson that day, never to sit in those sections again, no matter how cheap they were. But uh, anyways, yeah, that that pass, Ladarius Bishop got caught looking in the backfield, just got burnt. And uh, I think what all of, I think what really, got everybody going was just we've seen this under Chad Morris and uh of course Bielema his last couple of years and you know it it if you felt like that was kind of happening because you saw that story you've seen that movie before and and uh it really hurt very for a second it was it, it was it made you mad and then they turned it around scored 31 answered and you know that doesn't happen under Morris, that that team would have not done that. They wouldn't have turned it around. They wouldn't have made the adjustments they needed to make. Um, so it's good to see that. So the sky was falling, but it, it leveled out a little bit. And I, I think we're all right. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to work on. And I like how Pittman said that, you know, after we beat Mississippi State last year, there was a lot of things to work on in that game too, you know. And that's so. – that's what we're going to have to do. There's a lot, definitely a lot of work to do. And I know I'm, I was right along with you guys with the PTSD of the Chad Morris error uh, coming back into play, especially in that first half, then starting the third quarter where they, they come out and they, they hit that long bomb that Brad was talking about. And Brad texted me about that time. He literally said, Hey guys, we're about to lose this game. And yeah. that was a turning point. And I mean, I was having PTSD. I'm going, not again. And uh, another guy that's unfortunately suffering from a real life PTSD right now in a way is Dorian Gerald uh, once again out for the season um, with a leg injury. Yeah, terrible, terrible blow for the Razorbacks. And unfortunately, a guy that came in as the number one Juco defensive player in the country 
uh, Arkansas never got to see what he could do. And that's unfortunate. It's terrible. Um, and, you know, what do you say? Uh, you just – there's just not a lot to say at this point, and you just have to, you know, hope for the best for Dorian. And then the Razorbacks have got to adjust, and then you've also got to hope that you don't take any more major injuries into the defensive line because you get to a point where a possible strength of the team becomes a weakness of the team very quickly. Yeah, what worries me about the injury is is – He's a one of the bigger ends. He's not the rush end. He's the other end. And, you know, Utsi kind of plays that same role. And we've got Gregory, who was kind of an in, and they've kind of made him an inside outside guy. And Utsi can play inside and outside. But, you know, you got Ridgeway coming back from his appendectomy and everything's looking good. He's practicing and maybe he's a week ahead of schedule. And uh, they're saying he's not having any soreness or anything after practice. So that's awesome. We're going to need him big time. But what hurts is, you now lose a guy. I feel like Gregory and, and some of those guys have to play that end spot maybe a little bit more, unless some of these younger guys like Joshua Stewart and Zach Williams and some of those guys, Matthias Oli, can uh, kind of step up their game and solidify it there. And, and, and if so, that's great. We can still do on the rotations we're doing. But it kind of it, it worries me on the inside. If we lo- if we get an injury there, like we lost Ridgeway the first game, this could really compound itself a little bit. Well, it's definitely an area that is of concern for the Arkansas Razorbacks. You look at the defensive line, it's an area that, you know, really was a a sore spot last year with the depth. And uh, we're starting to take some hits with with Ridgeway. Luckily, he's he's going to be back. We, it looks like he's he's recovering well from his appendectomy. But Dorian Gerald is done for the season, and that's going to put a hit on a defensive line that's already kind of short, um, like you were saying. And you know, looking at at Rice, luckily that didn't. You know, the defensive line played well against Rice. Uh, I think the whole defense as a whole played well against Rice, but that first half offensively was miserable. Quarterback play, we've said it all along, that that the quarterback situation at Arkansas will tell the tale of the season, probably more than ever before. Um, You know, there's times that you could get away with a serviceable quarterback and be okay because you've got all these pieces around them. Arkansas does have pretty good pieces around K.J. Jefferson. But in the offense that we run, serviceability is just not there. You've got to be able to to be good. You know, they talk about a 65% completion percentage because they run the no-huddle offense and they want to keep the ball off the ground and they want to keep the clock moving, but they want to move as fast as they can against that clock. And so with that being said, um, K.J.'s got to be good. And, um, and, boy, that first half, he was awful. He wasn't just bad. He was awful. And I know that that gets a lot of people worried. Uh, you talk about Chad Morris PTSD, the fact that you can't find a quarterback, that, that is definitely something to worry about. But he came out in the second half, really put up some good numbers. Uh, right. You know, really, if you double his numbers from what he did in the, the second half, I mean, he threw for like 128 yards in the second half. He was like – nine of 10 or something like that, a touchdown. So basically, if you double those numbers, he's 18 of 22, 56 and two touchdowns, along with two rushing touchdowns. We're having a major different conversation this week over him. So uh, we know he can throw the ball better. We've seen it um, against Missouri. Uh, Missouri is an SEC team. Um, You know, even though their defense wasn't great last year, um, I think that, that we've got to see K.J. be that kind of K.J. a little bit more and a little bit less of what we saw in the first half. And, you know, again, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens because, obviously, Texas is a step up from Rice. So we'll see what the matchups are going to be and um, see what happens from here. Yeah, I mean, he. I think he was like four for nine or four for 11 but in the first half, but he had four drops. I mean – You've got a guy like Burks, and we talked about it a little bit last week, how he, you know, he didn't get the practice, and you th- that showed. He was rusty because he's coming off that injury. And he, uh, you know, he dropped two passes. Devion Warren had a drop. There was another one in there. So you take those four incompletions out, and his numbers look a little better. We get some more first downs. We don't know what would have happened. So I think nerves definitely played a part. It's the first time these guys have played in front of more than – 30, 40,000 because of the COVID restrictions last year. So it was a big deal, a big atmosphere. I think they were amped up, and I, I think that played a part. And, and Coach Pittman, he talked about that. And uh, let's go talk, let's go listen to that right now. 
we had a lot of missed blocking assignments out on the edge, you know, uh, coming out from inside out, um, especially on those little quick tosses that we had. We really worked on them. I don't understand how we, we made that mistake, but we did. Uh, all those things are correctable. But I, I, I honestly, I think whenever he started running the ball, I believe he's a guy when he runs the ball, he's a better thrower. We did about everything we possibly could do wrong in the first half. A lot of penalties, um, a lot of drops. Uh, defense did a really good job in the first half. They had, you know, they had field position the whole time because we couldn't get any first downs, and and uh, we just didn't play well at all. Uh, but uh, we came back in the second half. We still had way too many penalties, but we did catch the ball a little bit better. KJ started making some plays. Defense. I thought the rush got to their quarterback a little bit, and he threw us a few three interceptions, which was big. We got a lot to improve on. Uh, I told the team that we were going to face adversity, but I didn't know it was going to be the entire first half. Um, but it was, and give Rice credit, they they were really prepared. They did a nice job. I'm so happy we won. Uh, but we we didn't feel a very good football team today, and we've got to get a lot better. I told half, I said, you know, Rice is kicking our butt in special teams. You know, they're more, they're, they, were, they were more urgent than us. They, you know, they blocked a punt on us. Uh, we just missed a block on the outside. I mean, that's all it was. And, uh, but, I mean, people go through games and don't get punts blocked. And we need to be those people. And, uh, and we need to hold on to the ball when we return it and all those things. There's a lot of bad stuff out there that looked like, as a head coach, that, that it wasn't a very well-coached football team. And, and I, that's that's me. That is nobody else. That's me. But I, I, I'm certainly, I think all of us would have a little bit of nerves going into that game. And I'm so glad that we won, you know, and we have so much that we can improve on and so much that we can, you know, that we have to. But it sure is, you know, we're going. we would coach them anyway, either way. But it's just nice that the kids came back, and you got to give our kids credit to that too to come back and win and, and win the game. So there's Coach Pittman, kind of looking back at Rice, and you know there's a lot of things that we can talk about what we what we didn't like, what we did like, and you know one of the things that caught my attention on I think it was probably the first play is KJ rolls out to the left, he's trying to scramble and throw, and he's hanging on to that ball, and I'm sitting here going he's going to have to get rid of it, and you can see kind of in the moment that KJ was playing like he had been practicing. You know, he did, it was almost like he didn't realize this is a live rep and these guys are going to tackle you. And that's sure enough what happened. He ate a sack because he didn't throw the ball away or, or try to get rid of it or even scramble. And you can see that, that the first kind of opening start, big game, crowd behind you jitters were certainly affecting KJ in that first half. You know, the thing was that KJ did not get tackled during the offseason. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, green jerseys. I mean, there's all kinds of factors. I mean, it is so much different when you play a live game versus practice. And especially you're not going to try to get your quarterbacks hurt, you know, and that's just the day that we live in. I don't know. You can go all the way back to um, 2006, I think, when USC. Mitch Mustaine and Casey Dick were, were uh, playing. And, of course, Robert Johnson started that USC game that year because Casey Dick got hit by Sam Oljabutu right in the middle of the back, injured his back. He didn't come back until late in the season that year. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how that season would have went, but, you know, quarterback play was as – I mean, they made the SEC championship game, and quarterback play was still a major, major uh, conflict on that team. So you don't want your quarterbacks getting hit. And so but with that said, you know, you just kind of take the good with the bad. And uh, we saw some bad, obviously. Um, but, again, we also saw some good in the second half. So, And we also saw some legs. That guy can run. Um, and so we'll see what happens here again. We're going to know a lot more about K.J. Jefferson. We're going to know a lot more about the Razorbacks. We're going to know a lot more about everything after this week. Yeah, and and uh, sorry, I uh, I thought you were going to talk about how back in that 2006 season when it, we played USC the second time, Felix Jones, because remember that was when McFadden had the the screw in his toe and he had it removed right before the season started. Jones had a 
a green shirt on or an anthracite, whatever they were doing. Then it wasn't anthracite. I think it was green. And he wasn't allowed to, to be hit. And he fumbled three times in that first half. We ended up losing 50 to 14 in a game that they weren't that much better than us that year. It just was a lot going into it. And, and KJ hadn't been hit all season. And that, that you see that from time to time, it plays a factor. Uh, you know, something that we've talked about many times over the summer is I was excited because I wanted to see KJ in top of a, you know, more of a, a running rope. Like, like I wanted to see more read options. I wanted to see some design runs from him. Use that 6'3", 240-pound body that can move down the field as well in a T-ball type style. And we didn't see none of that. We seen that they used them, in my opinion, just like they used the Felipe Franks, you know, that's a throw first guy. And I felt like we saw that kind of get adjusted to a little bit more in the second half and they utilized what they had. Now, maybe they've got that ready and maybe they just didn't think they were going to need to do that against Rice. And they didn't need to put him in those situations where he's going to get hit a lot more. But, you know, we obviously seen that they definitely need to do that. They got to take advantage of what they got. And KJ is a, he's a great athlete and he's got a lot of tools. And I think he's just if you put him in those roles and like Pittman said, once he starts running a little bit, it helps him calm down. And he starts making better passes. And that's ex that's something I want to see definitely moving forward next uh, this Texas game to see how that kind of yeah. comes along. And you nailed it on the hedge, Rand, because that's exactly what Pittman said, is that KJ throws better when he's on the run. And, you know, when he first said that, I thought, well, that certainly didn't happen in the first half. Uh, as KJ is trying to scramble out to the right and, and forces a pass that should have sailed 15 yards out of bound and ends up getting picked off. It was a pass that never should have been thrown, at least in bounds, uh, to where anyone could have had a chance at it. And those are the types of, of mistakes that KJ made uh, in the quarterback position that I think any quarterback can make in that first game type of start. Um, so I don't really put too much of that on KJ. I know looking back on it, I've had a chance to go back and watch the game a few times. And, you know, you in the moment, I was not very pleased. I was not pleased at all. And, and here's the other thing is due to Chad Morris, you know, I'm sitting there going, well, who's our next quarterback? Let's see who what he's got because Chad Morris would play 14 quarterbacks in a game. And it breaks up the flow. Look what that did to Rice when they're using two quarterbacks. Didn't work out too well to, for them, did it? And But one thing you can say about Sam Pittman, he stuck with KJ. He said, KJ's my guy. I don't. He's going to struggle. He's going to take some hits. And he's going to get better from that. And he's going to get the experience that he needs to maybe come out against Texas and put a whipping on him. And I, I admire that, uh, uh, you know, about Sam Pittman, keeping him in there. Uh, because at the moment I was ready to yank it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And I, I know a lot of people were calling for Hornsby and, you know, Hornsby may end up being the guy at some point, but I like the fact that Sam said, no, we're going to keep with this guy. We're going to keep with the guy that we, we went through whole fall camp with now, right. uh, you know, how many games, how many times do you got to see? I don't, I don't know. But again, he did play better in the second half, so we will see. But I'll tell you one guy that you didn't have to worry about pulling, and that was Quinn Grovey. And uh, we got Quinn Grovey here. And we're going to talk a little bit about Texas and the history and uh, what he saw against Rice and the whole nine yards. Uh, what a great interview Quinn was. So we're going to take it right to Quinn Grovey right now. Well, Quinn, you're in our, you're in our intro. I just want you to know that. Oh, I am. What? Yeah. How, how am I in the intro? So, <laughs> funny you story, are, right? <laughs> you are uh, honestly the first Razorback quarterback I remember. Uh. Yep, yep. You're the first Razorback quarterback I remember. I um, back in the Quinn Grovey days, he said in the '88, '89. Uh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh. That, that's what. That's when I grew up on hog football and and hoops. I like and it. The great that's time. It. I the like great it. time. So I also like hear, and this is interest to me because I I was a flag football quarterback, but I hear you have some flag football exploits. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it worked out. I mean, I decided to go ahead and take my uh my talent to the, the flag football uh arena. Yeah, yeah it, it's worked out. Yeah, but yeah, I had to I, I played we were on vacation, man. Three weeks ago, we were in Destin on the beach, and I'm playing beach football and so I, I got two 11 year olds on my team 
and we're playing against these old dudes and they're just really trying to <laughs> and, and i say that like i'm not an old dude but we're playing against these old dudes and, and they want to take advantage of the 11 year olds they want to post them up box them out and treat them bad and i say you know what i'm about to impose my will so i decided to impose right. my will and i pulled my hamstring and so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it was yeah. it was a bad deal buddy i mean my hamstring ain't hey, look it's hard enough to walk on sand but it's hard enough, it's it's even harder to walk on on sand with a pull hamstring yeah i play flag football on it that's probably even harder uh <laughs> but uh yeah i've heard uh i had uh, i quarterbacked the number two flag football team in the country at one point wow and uh we had we had a big system and it's a long time ago for me too. Now. Sound like it worked though. Sound like the it, system was pretty good. Yeah, it was. Believe it or not, I, I actually <laughs> um, watched a guy that was about forty-five <laughs> at the time. He he may have been older than that. He was an intramural director. Uh-huh. He didn't move. He didn't. I mean, he just picked people apart though. I mean, mm. dropping dimes on folks. And was he left-handed? No, no, he wasn't okay. left-handed. Right. But, oh man, his name. What was his name? Doug something. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But anyway, let's talk some hogs. Let's do it. Um, we we got all this stuff to talk about Texas, but let's get some impressions from last week from you. Well, I mean, taking a look at the football game, I mean, your ultimate goal is to get the W. And that's what they did. And, you know, when you look at the the schematics of the game and overall looking at the football game, Arkansas did what they needed to do in the second half to uh, distance themselves from Rice. But a lot of people would say, okay, why are you even down 17 to 7? And But, you know, Arkansas did a very nice job. Look, when you get down 17 to 7 in the third quarter, there's a lot of temptations that you have to resist. There's a lot of things you have to – urges you have to fight through. This football team did a nice job of fighting through all those urges, and all they did was come back and score 31 unanswered points. And so, to me, that shows a lot about this team. That shows about uh, a lot about this leadership and this coaching staff, that they were not going to fold their tent, that they were going to fight. And that, that, that's the thing that I see from, from Saturday. This team fought. They had a slow start, but they fought back and did what they needed to do. Well, you know a little bit about quarterback play. And uh, give us give us your assessment on KJ. Well, yeah, looking at KJ, I thought he played a solid game. Now, a lot of people are going to look at his completion percent and go, you know, maybe he wasn't as accurate. And so I look at it. He was 12 of 21. And one of the things that Kendall Brow said is we want to get him to 65 percent completion percent. If we can do that, the offense is going to be very effective, especially with his ability to run the football. He was at 57% at 12 of 21. The guy had three, maybe four drops. Traylon Burks dropped two balls, which he's never going to drop ever. Uh, Davion Warren dropped one. So he could have easily, uh, KJ could have easily been 15 of 21 or 16 to 21, which would have put him at 71%. The thing about KJ is, I mean, you know, I, people just need to really understand the beauty of KJ. I mean, the big fella took off in the in the first quarter on a 34 yard touchdown run, nobody wanted to get in his way. I mean, he outran everybody. Nobody wanted to tackle him. Third quarter, they, they ran their first option play. He went 60 yards for a touchdown, 65 yards for a touchdown, but it was called back. He can do so many other things and the, he has a strong arm. He can make every throw out there, but uh, it's just a matter of him just really understanding what it's going to take for him to be the quarterback for the university of Arkansas. Everybody coming to the stadium is going to talk about KJ. Everybody at halftime is going to talk about KJ. Everybody driving home is going to talk about KJ. So once you understand that, you can deal with that. But, you know, overall, I thought, I thought, you know, the reason why people may have said that maybe he was not as accurate as he, he should have been is looking at the first few passes. They were a little high, and maybe people were going, man, golly. But the guy was still 12 of 21, 57%, had three drops. So I think that there are some things that he did extremely well in the passing game, some things he did well in the run game. And I think he's going to be better forward when you get ready for this Texas game. So, um, yeah, I'm a KJ fan. I think he's a, um, I think he's going to, when he finds his way and and does it the way he wants to do it, um, he's going to be tough to deal with. 
Talk a little bit about atmosphere. You know, Reynolds Razorback Stadium has changed quite a bit since uh, since your days. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and so has the rivalries that we face. But Rice comes into town. Kind of compare that to, to the way it was when you were when you were taking the field and leading the charge. And, and how was that game atmosphere last week? And how do you expect it to be this coming week? Well, I think the game atmosphere last week was really great because, I mean, you, you were just coming off 2020 where nobody or everybody that wanted to get to the game couldn't get to the game. And so I, I thought 2020 provided a lot of release uh, and an outlet to all Razorback fans and, and just football fans in general. Those student athletes had to go through a lot to play last year. And it brought a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people, even if you weren't in the stands. But it was great to pull up on Saturday morning and be able to see all the tailgaters, uh, the tent set up, the music being played, the barbecue grills being uh, fired up, uh, just walking by saying hello, seeing people. They were so happy uh, tailgating. And then when everybody got into the stadium, I thought the stadium was, was, was very, very electric. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's great to, to have football back, fans back. But this week, this is going to be a different week. It's going to be a lot of people. Look, my only concern, here's my concern, SEC Nation, and we just got through talking to Laura Relich on our podcast, SEC Nation is going to start at 9 in the morning. The game is going to be at 6 p.m. I just need all our fans to hydrate properly. <laughs> hydrate properly and make sure that you can get into the game because uh, we're going to need you. We're going right. to need you to cheer. We don't need nobody taking no naps. We don't need nobody not showing up saying, hey, I'll be there later. Hey, do all that. Make sure you're ready to go. But 6 p.m. is going to be a long time because I think fans are going to start. I mean, fans are probably coming in right now. And I think fans are going to be in Fayetteville ready to go. And they're going to be ready to tie one on. So we just need the fan support there to make sure that we got that seven point advantage when it talks about home field advantage. Well, considering that Texas is a six-point favorite on the road, that seven-point advantage is going to be. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's going to be big. So let's talk a little bit about Texas. You've had a little bit of experience with them. Uh, tell us your favorite memory of playing against Texas. Well, since I was one in three versus Texas, my favorite memory is going to be in 1988 when we beat them down in Austin. And uh, we were 10-0 in the Southwest Conference, had a chance to play for a national championship. We lost to Miami 18-16 um, down there in the last game of the season. But we uh, we were killing Texas. I mean, just beating the brakes off them. 24-3 like in the first half. But in Texas fashion, they found a way to get back into the game. They switched quarterbacks, and they were able to get back in the game. If it wasn't for an interception by Steve Atwater, that could have been another Whew, that could have been another close call. We beat them 27-24 after we were up on them 24-3. Um, but um, that that's probably my biggest memory of – a pleasant memory of Texas. I mean, one of the worst ones was in 1987 when they threw a, a last-second touchdown pass, Brett Stafford to Tony Jones, that beat us at on, on the last play of the game in Little Rock. That one hurt too. So, But, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of fond memories of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well uh... – I remember, and, and I really the the story of the the uh, rivalry or the series is a lot of heartbreak, but yeah. also a, some super joyous occasions when they did beat them, such as sixty four. Oh yeah, eighty one. Yeah, you know, you go to two thousand three, two thousand fourteen. Of course, there are several others as well. Um, what was it like when you actually did get over the hump and actually beat them? It was great. I mean, because you knew if you beat Texas, you were going to have an opportunity to, um, to, to win a conference championship. And that's really what we cared about. Like I said, in 88, we, we went 10 and 0 in our conference and that was, it was good to beat Texas down there. And then the following year, we, we, uh, in 89, we were number six in the country and we lost to an unranked Texas team in Fayetteville. Um, that's when number five, four, and three lost in front of us. So we probably would have been number two in the country had we won that football game. The following week, we had to play against Andre Ware and Houston. And so, uh, you know, you, you beat Texas, you win that game. And, uh, I mean, it just seems like Texas was always in the way to mess up some type of 
national championship mm-hmm. run or conference run. And I think that that's why the hatred and hatred is such a strong word, but the, <laughs> the, 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 this, the dislike of Texas, I think that that's really where, where it comes from because they all, I don't care what, I mean, we could have the better team and they would always sneak out the back door with some type of win. It just, it just drives me nuts. I mean, so. You know, with Texas joining back into the SEC, we're going to have that renewed rivalry again, a uh, yearly uh, possibility of playing Texas every year. How do you see that rivalry transforming, uh, you know, back to the good old days again, or is it going to be a little different? No, I think it, I think, I think it'll be back. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things right now where, I mean, it, it, probably if you're 40 and above, you understand the Texas rivalry much more than 30 and below. But I think that once you bring Texas back into the conference, there's going to be that hatred again, that, 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 that rivalry again. A lot of times I've said that Arkansas has been so amped up for Texas because Texas has always been Arkansas's number one rival. And I don't think that from a Texas standpoint, that that's always been the case. I think they look at A&M, Oklahoma, and then maybe we're third in the pecking order, but for the first time, looking at this football game with the timing of the announcement of S- uh, Texas coming to the SEC, I think Texas is going to be more amped up, kind of like Arkansas was in the past, but with like maybe we've got something to prove. Arkansas has been in the conference, and this is going to be Texas's first really SEC opponent since the announcement. And so I think they're going to be wanting to try to make a statement. So I think they'll come in a little jacked up. And I think Arkansas is going to be the more of the, the comfortable team as we get ready to play on Saturday. That's an interesting thought for sure. For sure. Uh, I think that they are walking into a buzzsaw. Um, you've got a, a fan base that is hungry for some wins. You know what I mean? Uh, I think part of part of the disappointment of last week was – there was a little Chad Morris PTSD in there <laughs> a little bit. You know what I mean? It was, it was pretty rough. Um, you know, just people saying, you know, we, there's hope. There's always hope at the beginning of the season. And then they kind of felt like it might've been taken away a little bit. Second half looked good. Let's talk yeah. about the defense a little bit. Yeah. Personally, okay. I think the defense has a very good shot at being a really good defense this year. What do you see in the defense? Well, a couple of things when you think about the defense. I think that, uh, like we talked about in the first half last week against Rice, I thought that the defense really kept you in the football game. And you were very fortunate to only be down 10 to 7, considering the field position that they had to deal with on a consistent basis in the first half. And, I mean, you got you get a block punt. Offense is not moving the football. Rice played in Arkansas's territory the entire time. They only ended up with 10 points going into the first half. So you got to give the defense a whole lot of credit. And I think in the second half, again, they got up on a 17-7, but the defense came up with a huge stop when it was 17-14 when Rice was moving in on the goal line. They got a fourth down stop, and then we just absolutely just exploded the rest of the way. But I think it goes back to Barry Odom, this this defensive staff, and, I, and it goes back to me, the fact that you brought in three transfers, Markel Utzi, John Ridgeway, and Trey Williams. Those three guys are starters for you or will be starters for you. But now you've got the guys like Isaiah Nichols, Eric Gregory, Mateo Soli, uh, Zach Williams that played a lot that are now second team. But now you've got a rotation. If you want to win in the SEC, you've got to be very good in the trenches, offensively and defensively. And so I think you've got too deep on the defensive front. When you've got a good defensive front and you've got two or three great linebackers like Bumper and Grant Morgan, that's going to allow them to roam free. That's going to allow them to make a – they made over 100 tackles last year. I mean, they may make 150 tackles this year if that defensive line does what they need to do. The thing you want to see from them is how do they create tackles for losses now because that defensive line is eating up a lot of those offensive line uh, blockers. But, yeah, the defense is in a great a great position. Linebackers, you got you got depth at the defensive line. And then the secondary, anytime there's a tip ball, Jalen Catalan is looking to get it. I mean, he's just all over. He's a ball hawk. He's great. Monteric Brown had a pick as well. Three picks uh, in one weekend. And that's what you got to have, a defense that's very opportunistic, that can turn the football over. So I think they're good on all three levels. And defense is going to be the calling card for the first couple of weeks of the season. 
Yeah, Texas, like you said, they're going to come in pretty stoked to, to play an SEC opponent since the first time since that announcement. And I, I think you're spot on with that. And uh, that being said, what do you see as Arkansas's keys to a victory over Texas this week? Well, you know, their, their quarterback Hudson card was, was, was pretty good. He was 14 to 21 for 224 yards and a couple of touchdowns. He's athletic as well. He can get outside, but you're going to have to stop Robinson. They're running back. He was the big 12 offensive player of the week last week. And uh, he had 20 carries for 104 yards. They're going to try to run the football against Arkansas. I, you know, that defensive front again. And I, I think that plays into Arkansas's hands. I think defensively, when I look at Texas, offensively versus Arkansas defensively, I give the advantage to Arkansas defensively and Barry Odom. So I feel good about that. Question is going to come down to what is Arkansas's offense going to do and uh, how are they going to provide value and, uh, you know, not have a slow start. So KJ is going to have to get off the snipe. I think he will. I think after the game last week, he will course correct and be ready to go. He'll be amped up. He'll be fired up. Traylon Burks will have the rust knocked off of him. Um, you'll get some production from the other wide receivers. And what I like about it, the offensive line was very good in short yardage situations, and they were very good in the red zone. Uh, uh, you know, Traylon Smith walked in for a touchdown. Dominique Johnson walked in for a touchdown. So that's what you want to see from this offense. And then you got some running backs that are starting to come along as well. So it's going to be a battle. I know Texas is favored. But this Arkansas fan base is going to be ready to go, and I think this Arkansas football team is going to fight like fight like heck to get a victory. What do you think a, a victory would mean to Sam Pittman and the Razorback program? Uh, it's, I mean, one, it's the next game on the schedule. I mean, I know that's coach talk. But two, I mean, it's, it's the number 15 team in the country. And three, it's a rival that's coming to the SEC. So I think you beat a number 15 team in the country, you beat a rival. Uh, people across the country are going to take notice to what Sam Pittman and this Razorback football team is doing. And uh, you get your opportunity. I mean, uh, they control their own destiny. And so you get a team like Texas coming into town. Uh, I feel like you're, you're, you're probably going to be more physical than them because you've been in the SEC so long. And I hope to see that really show up. All right. Well, Quinn, man, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out with us. And, uh, we're looking forward to it on Saturday night. It's going to be fun. All right, fellas. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Quinn Grovey joining us here on the Razor Wire, and we'll be back in just a moment. Quinn Grovey joining us here. And, you know, either that interview started before it even started. I mean, we we're like, hey, let's just roll with it. And what a great guy. Yeah, he was a good guy, man. Uh, just down to earth. You know, some of those guys, some can be like, hey, man, I'm Quinn Grovey, you know. But he's not like that. And I like that about him. And, uh, man, he he gave us some good insight on on quarterback play and Rice. And, and then, of course, the Texas series, you can see, the little hurt that's in his eyes when it comes to Texas. I wanted to talk to him about it. I remember this game that I believe it was the 86 or 87. Well, I'm thinking 89 game that I remember. And I need to look this up. Texas beat us 24 to 20. And this is the way the series goes, by the way. This is like a microcosm of, of the series is that Texas would come in Arkansas would have the better team that year. Texas would come in two and three, three and two, whatever. Middle, you know, they played Arkansas right after Oklahoma every year. Texas would come in and Arkansas would be primed to beat them and lose almost, it seemed like every time. But, you know, there's a big discrepancy that people talk about, about the, the series record. And the series record is very lopsided in Texas's favor. Arkansas and Texas have played 78 times, and um, Arkansas has beaten them 22 of those times. So 56 to 22 is, is the series record. But the two teams started playing in 1894, 
And uh, Texas won 27 of the first 32 meetings up until 1950. The series started evening out at that point. Frank Broyles came to Arkansas, really kind of even launched in the 1960s, really more than even the 50s. But um, Arkansas, if you take from 1950 on to now, Arkansas is 25 and 17, or I'm sorry, Texas is 25 and 17 versus Arkansas, which is a much more respectable number than the 56-22 beat down so much. But there are so many games throughout the history, go back to 1969, that the big shootout, Arkansas was up 14-0, and uh, Texas scores 15 in the fourth quarter to beat Arkansas. There's, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many games were like that where Arkansas had the better team, but somehow Texas won. Not saying that Arkansas had the better team in 69, but they should have won. That was the game of the century, still dubbed the game <laughs> of the century even now. Um, and, uh, you know, one versus two, Hogs versus Horns. Nixon was at the game. He crowns a national championship. They move that game from the middle of the season to the very end of the season to crown a national champion there it it was just it was a main for tv deal billy graham was there all kinds of big time three presidents were were in that were were there it was it was amazing there's a book about that game um what is it what is it called horns hogs and nixon's coming i want to say yeah something like that so big time history here really between the two teams um you know i think that there's a chip on the razorbacks shoulder people from arkansas because one, we're a much smaller state than what Texas is. We don't get the recruits that Texas gets at any time. You know, they can go in their backyard, pick out 25 kids, and then they bring them in and, you know, see what happens. But this is really a major piece of college football, Arkansas versus Texas. It really is. The Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan, Notre Dame, Ohio mm-hmm. State, Michigan, uh, <clears throat> teams like the games like that. Um, Arkansas played Texas all the way up into 1991, didn't play them again until 2000. Since Arkansas joined the SEC, they're four and two versus the Longhorns. And so very interesting situation, very interesting history between the two. Um, and then, of course, we know that in 2025, so they say uh, Texas and Oklahoma will be coming into the SEC. Believe it or not, Arkansas and Oklahoma haven't played at, in a regular season game since like 1908 or something like that. Crazy, wow. crazy number. Uh, but anyway, back to Texas, you're going to see that. I think you'll see that become again, like it, like it was. I don't think that Texas is ever going to consider Arkansas their major rival. I think A&M will always be ahead of them. And so will Oklahoma. <laughs> but I think that you've got some regionality there and some, some real, especially on Arkansas's end hatred, there and I think that uh, Texas, whether they want to admit it or not, they don't like Arkansas. Yep. So let's just yep. pause it right there, and you back it up. Anybody that's under thirty or so, if you don't understand the dynamic between Arkansas and Texas and why that hatred is there, bring it back. Listen to what Brad just said because that's key pieces of information right there. On you know, if you don't understand this Arkansas Texas rivalry, now you do. Yeah, I mean. It, it's it was so heated in the 60s they were the two top teams of the south really at that time um i mean you could throw bama in there but um you know you had daryl royal texas and broils and and you know that 69 big shootout my wife's cousin actually jerry moore he's guarding randy peschel peschel is the one it was kind of a trick play they weren't expecting him to split in to get that pass play the way they did it and that set him up short and go or you know down inside the red zone end up scoring a touchdown and then two point to win it. Um, Just so many, so many, you know, game, different storylines that go back and forth over this series. Um, Definitely some hatreds there. The 69 team. All right. So think about this 64, we finish undefeated. We beat Texas. That's the year that um, Ken Hatfield has an 81 yard punt return to beat him in that game. We go on undefeated. We play in the, uh, Cotton Bowl versus Nebraska, we win that. Texas beats Alabama, but back then the AP poll, they chose their champion before the bowl games. So they had already said Bama's the champ, even though Bama loses to Texas. So that's why we are claimed as the national champ. Uh, there was one poll, I want to say the Brandon UPI Ryan. possibly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the one and, that, uh, yeah, the UPI trophy. 
Yeah. And so the very next year, what did they do? They said, oh, we don't want this to happen again. We're going to wait till after the bowl game. Well, what happens? We're 11 and 0 at the end of the season. Just like uh, I think it was Michigan State and it might have been Alabama again or it might have been Notre Dame. But three of us were all and they that year they could have gave us a claim. We could have at least said, hey, we're the national champs in 65 as well. That was that 22 game win streak. But what happened was they said because of the year before, because of us and the Texas beating Bama, they changed it. And we went on and lo lost our bowl game to the team I hate more than Texas, LS who, okay. We lose that game in a cotton bowl. And th that is a huge rivalry. People always want to act like it's not a rivalry. It is. It's something called the, 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 the Red River State Fair. It's the Arkansas LSU rivalry. If you want to go back, that started in the 1800s. And we played LSU for like 30 straight years or something until we quit playing on there for a huge gap. But it was the you've got the Red River shootout with Oklahoma and Texas. You had the Red River State Fair. That's a big deal that a lot of people don't know about. And that was Arkansas and LSU. And so, anyways, so you go back to all that, and we don't win the national championship because they changed it. And then they decided after that year, let's go back to how we were doing it before. So they doubled us over again. And then they they went and said, We're gonna call the championship our champ we're going to crown them before the bowl game for like two more years and then in either in 69 or 70 they officially went to back to wait till it's all said and done after the bowls like they've done ever since so i mean there, there's a lot of hatreds there uh 69 team a lot of people felt like arkansas was a better team and we let them off the hook in that game it's tough it was i mean there's a there is a real tough history there for arkansas I mean, as bad as, as the record is, it could be so much better. There could be so many more wins there. There were win there were times in the 70s and in, in the 80s as well that Texas kind of knocked Arkansas out of the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, one year Arkansas beats Texas, goes 11-0, goes into Miami, and loses 18-16 to with a chance to play for a national championship. So when you look at all of, of the history of Arkansas and you say, well, Arkansas is a terrible football program, blah, blah, blah. Arkansas actually has a very rich history in football. And uh, you know, it's, been a, it's been a tough go of it in the SEC for a lot of it, but the, look at what has happened. Um, it has, it's been, uh, been really, really a lot of bad, weird stuff has happened to Arkansas including their coach falling off the bike and, uh, you know, just kind of stuff like that all the time. And then you hire a guy like Chad Morris who can't even win on the high school level. I mean, it's just, it's just stuff like that. I mean, uh, that, that Arkansas, and let me throw this in too. And I could actually give you some history of coaching and what as well. Arkansas is always one with the right coach. Okay. Sam Pittman, is he the right coach? We don't know for sure. Petrino won. Lou Holtz won. Houston Nutt won to a certain degree. Absolutely. Frank Broyles won. Hatfield won. Those are the big coaches, big names throughout the years. If you go all the way back to 1941, um, Bear Bryant was on his way to, to become the Razorback head coach. And Pearl Harbor happened. And instead of driving to Fayetteville, he turned around and went and enlisted in the Army. You're talking about snake bitten. And that's what the whole history of Arkansas has been with with Texas has been snake bite after snake bite. But since they've joined the SEC again, they're four and two in those games. The last meeting that Arkansas had with Texas, um, it was a domination. I mean, Arkansas held Texas to 59 yards. They um, had seven, I believe, first downs. I mean, the 31 to seven uh, score really wasn't indicative of what it was. Arkansas that year finished last in the SEC West that year and still come and just boondocked. Texas, just yeah, beat them. And, and you hate it when a coach is like this, but Bielema was bragging about how they knew we were going to dominate them before that game ever started. And uh, I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. But he, he afterwards he was like, well, we kind of knew. We saw some things on tape. And we kind of knew that uh, it was going to turn out pretty well, you know. And that's – you don't normally like that. You know Bielema, he's cocky like that. And he got himself in trouble with his mouth a lot. But, yeah, we, we dominated. But it's still not as big of a domination as – is the uh, 99 game when we held them the negative 27 yards rushing oh, because we sacked, fine. we sacked uh, uh, Phil Sims's boy so many times and Chris Sims. And uh, 
and they also was a major apple white mm -hmm. as well and we it just got them both and uh that that was one that's one of that's probably my favorite all-time texas arkansas game right there cedric cobb 37 yard run 30 yard screen pass for a touchdown 37 yard touchdown run um and michael jenkins remember him kid that never got to play you know he's like a third fourth string running back a little bitty dude comes in and did he end up having over 200 in that game it was something insane he had well over 100 and uh was just like the the third stringer you know like cobbs went off he went off and uh, just one of my best memories ever. Houston Nutt was so good, and he could do what we're doing right now, tell about the history of the yes. – and, and just know everything and, and kind of get these kids going. Of course, back then in 2000, you know, you're only nine years removed from playing them on a regular basis. Now you're 30 years removed right. from playing them on a regular basis. So um, it does it does change the attitude and atmosphere. And, you know, as Quinn Grovey said in that interview, you know, basically, if you're 40, you understand what it's like to play Texas and play them every year. Um, if if you're like me and the first quarterback you remember for the Razorback football team is Quinn Grovey, Grovey. you remember it. But anybody below us really doesn't understand that, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't understand what it's like, doesn't under understand the heartbreak of so many years, so many times throughout the years that Arkansas experienced – just heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak when it came to playing Texas, including that 69 shootout game, which is probably the biggest heartbreak, maybe the biggest heartbreak in college football history. That's how rough it was. And it was bad. And none of that's lost on Sam Pittman. He's aware that uh, the Texas and the Longhorns and Dicker the kicker and all of those guys are coming into Fayetteville uh, for Saturday's game. And he's aware of that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Sam Pittman is trying to get this team fired up. Here's what Sam Pittman has to say about Texas. Well, they're well over 300 pounds on the offensive line. They've got a 350 pound nose guard. You know, um, I think they're built for speed. You know, they have a very fast team. Uh, so does SEC, but you know, SEC teams seem to be um, go a little bit bigger, you know, even though Texas, when they ro roll in here, they're going to look like a major college football team, just like any team that you'd play in the SEC. But, uh, you know, there's, I believe there's probably quite a bit more throwing in the Big 12 than what there would be in the SEC, even though our league's going that way a little bit more. Um, so I think Texas matches up size wise certainly talent wise to you know the schools in in our league they have linebackers that can that are very physical um uh 47 um uh, runs downhill he tried brock meyer he tries to steal gaps you got to be aware of that um uh, zero uh, overshone can fly um but they they have a, a nice size d line I really like uh, 18. Uh, he's a good edge rusher. He transferred it from Notre Dame. Uh, I don't want to disrespect him by trying to say his last name because I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but he's a really, really good player and a good pass rusher. Secondary-wise, you know, Jameson back and, and Foster. and I mean, they've got some good players back there, so um, they're not – you know, unless he surprises us in, in what we think he's going to do, uh, they're not a huge blitz team. Uh, they may become one. I look for them to play us a little tighter than maybe what they did Louisiana simply uh, because of KJ's ability to run. So we'll find out. You know, we need our good players to play good. I mean, that's just – that's any team. But, you know, I think our receivers will show up better, I think. Uh, you know, obviously with KJ, we had three or four drops there that uh, we had a penalty uh, on a lineman downfield that negated a, a big game for us. So we got to get away from those things. We got to quit hurting ourselves and dropping passes and, and having penalties. And that's coaching as well. And, you know, certainly all of us in the building have tried to figure out that situation. I think we'll be much better Saturday. But no, I mean, that's the thing about, you know, Texas is, you know, Sam Pittman's aware of that. He's aware that Texas is a good program. They're, we're going to be an underdog, you know, for this game. But how good is Texas? 
I think there's a lot of questions about this Texas team. Yeah. First off, I think that they played somewhat of an overrated uh, Louisiana team. Um, you know, I think they won nine games last year. Everybody's kind of expecting them to be, um, you know, one of the top teams in the Sun Belt, but they're a Sun Belt team. Let's not forget that. Wow. And um, so I think that there's something there right off the bat. Now, am I saying that they're not as good as Rice? I'm not saying that, but I will say that Rice – we talked about this in the last pod that they are they were expected to be a good team, or a decent team at least, yeah, defensively especially. And so, um, from what I understand, Texas had a little bit of trouble blocking them. Um, you know, they they only I think by John Jackson is, is that his name? What what is his name? I no. I've lost it there, and I know it's not. <laughs> he played for Arkansas. Well, it, it's close. It's close. Right? To is it really? You're yes. talking about the 350 pound nose guard they got? No, Texas no, no. Has? I'm talking about their their running back here. Um, Our, uh, Texas? Yeah. Robinson. 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 Mm-hmm. Robinson. Yeah, I was going to bring him up too. Go ahead. Yes. Very, very. He, you know, he's expected to be a big time running back. Just cracked 100 yards versus um, Louisiana. Um, you know, they ran a two quarterback system. I think it worked out okay for him for the most part. But, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are still questions about this Texas team that um, you, you've got to definitely say, hey, look, they're going into a hostile environment. Who knows what's going to happen here? Because I sure don't. Hudson Card threw for 224 yards. Um, I think that, uh, that they, they've got, to, they've got a, a, an opportunity to be a decent team this year. But, again, still question marks av- avail for Texas. Yeah, the, the Robinson guy, he, he's a true freshman, if I believe. And the dude is – I mean, he's cut up like coleslaw. And uh, the dude is they're, – they're using him as a punt returner. You don't see that. Punt returner, kick returner, running back, comes out of wide receiver. I, I mean, well, you know what I'm saying? They throw it to him out of the backfield. Um, he's a dynamic playmaker. And they're, they're, they've got – I mean, he's going to be there for a while. And uh, they've got something special with that kid. He's going to be a good one. Um, so he's definitely somebody we have to really uh, have a game plan for and a spy for and not have him bumper pull in there that first half doesn't help things yeah. for sure. And, and you know, that's one of those things where we haven't talked about that any, but, you know, this, this whole targeting thing and a new rule changes to it, it's, it's difficult. And you hear Pittman talk about how, you know, basically they're, they're, they're basically trying to tell him to go a little bit lower, but what do you do when a, when a running back lowers his head at the last second, when you're, you're 230 pounds running a four seven and he's running a four five and you're about to hit. And all of a sudden within a split second, he, he drops his head. You know what I'm saying? So that that's a tough thing. Um, I think they look pretty good though. Texas overall. I really do. Um, we don't know what we got because it's Louisiana out of the Sun Belt, and we don't know exactly what we got at Arkansas because of rice, but I feel like it's, uh, he's a sophomore. Okay. Sorry. Anyways, but I, I feel like they, uh, you know, we're going to find out a lot by both teams. But I do think Sarkeesian has uh, got – I'm impressed with his first game, put it that way. I'm more, way more impressed than I was with Herman's first game at Texas. So, we'll see what, what happens and what unfolds Saturday night. Well, it's definitely going to be interesting because one thing that you mentioned was those penalties. And as far as those, um, you know, targeting calls, according to the way the rules are written, I think those were the right calls. That's one thing that you're going to know about me is – you know, I want the calls to go our way, but I'm going to call it like I see it. And, and you know, they were bang, the bang. Bill. They were bang, bang. Uh, it could have went either way, but it wasn't so much of a disparity where I was thinking, well, that's a bad call. I didn't have that thought. I thought it was definitely according to the way the rules are written. That's the way it should be called. But you're going to get to a point to where you keep, like you said, Jaren, you keep forcing them to go lower and lower. At what point does the defender start getting suffered, you know, from injuries, from having to avoid a head-to-head injury that's going to keep them out of the next half. Um, I, you I, think gotta... defenders need, I think defenders need to do the cross-body block like the WWE, just throw themselves, <laughs> you know, just jump and just throw themselves up. Kidneys, get wide. Just, that way you don't, you know. yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know, man. I, I felt like that there, if you looked real close at bumper pulls, I felt like he might have got his head around the body. But what you see when, right. when you saw that replay is you saw him lower the head. But you yep. can't go low without lowering your head. I know. Exactly. It leads your body. You know? you know, your head leads your body. I understand you got to get your shoulder in there. 
but your head's still launching. It's got to, you know what I'm saying? So I, I agree, man. It's, it's tough on defenders. And, and is this going to cause more lower leg injuries to ball carriers because Good. they're all aiming for the kneecaps basically now, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I, I get flashbacks of uh, the running back from Miami in the, in the championship game. Was it the orange yeah. bow back in the day, the BCS? Willis yeah. Willis McGahey. And, uh, I don't want to see those kind of injuries for sure. Well, football, you cannot legislate injuries out of the game. Um, I think what they did was they took the the they tried to do the the targeting rule to keep you from really being malicious with it. Well, now right. I see that guys are not being malicious with it, and they're still getting thrown out. And my thing is, look, if you want to have a fifteen yard penalty for that, fine, have a fifteen yard penalty right. for that. But throwing them out of the game for half or a whole game, whatever. It's ridiculous. If it's maybe. not and, malicious. Unless absolutely. you see them in team. Malicious, yeah. Exactly. Like may, maybe pull them for what we got out of bumper pull, especially. Because Morgan, you could say he didn't have to keep hitting the quarterback. He could have pulled off possibly. But on pulls, maybe pull them for the rest of that position and maybe the next one. Maybe not even the rest of the quarter, or maybe the rest of just the quarter they're in. You know what I'm saying? Right. If it ends up being the last play of the quarter, then he, he loses the next quarter but one quarter or, or something, but there definitely needs to be at least like you said, just a 15 yard penalty and no ejection or something. They've got to tweak this rule a little bit. So Arkansas is, you know, looking at this tough Texas team, what's Arkansas going to need to do to win this game Saturday? Play better. <laughs> they're going to have to, they're going to have to play. KJ Jefferson's got to play better. That's the number one thing right off the bat. Um, you cannot continue to put your defense in terrible positions and expect to win the ball game. I mean, that that defense in the first half especially, they were put in position after position that they were just – it was just a bad, bad spot for them, and they kept answering right. the bell. I mean, you've got yeah. to give those guys credit. And really, outside of two chunk plays all day long, Bryce didn't do anything. And you know what? If you're going to give two chunk plays up every game and it's not going to cost you that much, I'll take that. I mean, right. the defense answered the bell – every single play and they did show some depth you've already took a hit in that depth during gerald and uh, bumper pool not going to be there in the first half so you got to get through that but uh, the defense has a chance to be really good so they're going to yeah. have to continue to bring it until this offense can really figure it out um but i look for the offense to be better this week i really do i think that they'll they'll be more in sync they'll be more in step less penalties uh, you know, they, they couldn't even hardly snap the ball in the first half, right? Um, I look for Traylon Burks to be in the game plan more. And so I really expect Arkansas to play better. Is it going to be enough? I don't know. I mean, we all picked Arkansas to win this ball game, But uh, at the end of the day, this is a tall test. But there is so much riding on this ball game when it comes to the rest of the season for Arkansas because they don't get to go back and play in the Big 12. They got to come back and play in the SEC, and in two weeks they've got Texas A&M at Arlington, and that's going to be a tough one. Yeah, and I, I agree with what, everything you said there, Brad. And you know, uh, my biggest things are the read plays. I want to see how they call this game. I, I, I want, you know, KJ's got to calm down, and uh, you know, the crowd's going to be bigger this week. It's going to be the most intense crowd he's ever played in front of by far, um, especially starting in. So, I mean, are those nerves going to still be there? Because this amps up another level because he knows, everybody knows, this is Texas. You know, it's being talked to. Did y'all see the the Morris thing this morning that they talked about on on the morning rush? Uh, he he made a little skit. You know how Coach Morris does all this crazy stuff? and uh, Or Musselman, sorry. Coach Musselman does all this crazy stuff with uh, – Why are we talking you know, about Chad Morris, man? Yeah, I mean, come man. on. Come on. And, Anyways, it's like talking about the Taliban, okay? Let's just stop. <laughs> right. So he, he makes this up where he – it's like a pregame, you know, uh, what they're going to go over. And uh, it's the stadium diagram. He's got it on the whiteboard, and it's the coaches meeting. And, like, this is how we're going to break into the stadium to get into this game, how you're going to break me in. And we got all these different uh, – these options, you know, option one is he, he gets in the, the big hog fountain with all the hogs, but he's like, man, I don't know about this because I'm about to hold my breath. It's going to be tricky. Other option is the, they get a trampoline and he jumps over to stadium and everybody's like, man, I'm, you know, at my age, I'm worried about injuring myself. 
and uh, just talking about the cameras at the security gates and uh, the best time to come in, you know, during a hog call or right after a touchdown and stuff like that. It was hilarious. And and Ty and them on the morning rush were talking about how it would be hilarious if he follows this up and he dresses in like a Razorback mascot and he runs out on the field right before the game starts and he like punches like a fake Bevo mascot and uh, like knocks him out or something. And then he pulls his headgear off and it's Coach Dude. Musselman. And uh, that, that would be great. And That would uh, be amazing. That, and uh, that would be so good, but um, you know we we've got a. I want to see the the play calling, like I said, from Browse. You know they've got to accent what KJ does. You know they've got to put him in the right situations. We need some more read plays. We need to get him out, get him going, and and like we talked about, that'll help him calm down a little bit and make some easy throws for him and get some things set up. And that that's my biggest takes is I want to see that. Um, Andrew Parker the other day looked great. So there's another guy that, that I think will help us out by not having bumper in there that first half. Well, you got me Let's sold. Mention- you got me sold, Duran. Any plan that involves punching Bevo, I'm I'm all for. <laughs> Let's mention right. this name too, guys. I mean, I don't even know if it really fits into the conversation, but Jalen Catalan is an unbelievable player. Oh, my player. goodness. I mean, that mm-hmm. guy makes up for a lot of your deficiencies that you do have. He's he's a, a phenomenal player, probably the best safety in the country. I've never seen a guy be on somebody so quickly when they get the ball. Okay, whether it be the running back or whether it be a wide receiver, he reads the play and reads mm-hmm. the field so well. Um, he's in the perfect system here, where basically he gets to play center field. Doesn't really have any rules from the, what I can tell. It's just he just goes and does so, he not remind you of a Troy Polamalu a lot because oh, he's, 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 he's just so free ranging. Yeah. That that first chunk play was a broken tackle and he's the one that ran him down and tackled him. Uh, it yeah. was their first big like twenty yard gain, and he 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 dude his his form tackling is just great. I mean the way he wraps guys up, he you know that twist and everything on the right. hip and the leg, and I'm, it's it's special to have him. They're 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 saying Notre Dame's free safety. I don't know if y'all watched that game. He had those two picks. That guy's mm-hmm. amazing as well. He's supposed to be top five uh, projected. And Catalan's a redshirt sophomore. I hope he comes back for another yeah. year, but he's probably not going to, but we'll see. But uh, I love that other dude. I want to say his name is Thorpe for Notre Dame, but and it may not be. But Jalen Catalan is special, and I wouldn't trade him for anybody. And uh, have, he might be 5'10", but I'll take him all day long. Let me have one more thing. I'm excited about this week. I, I, we finally got something to talk about, number one. But yeah. – I cannot wait to see what the atmosphere is like in Donald Reynolds Razorback Stadium. I really think that you're looking at a 2010 Bama type atmosphere uh, where Greg McElroy said that was the loudest stadium he ever played in, and that was about 76, 77,000. You're going to be standing room only at this game. You're probably going to set an attendance record. there's going to be a lot of uh, lubing <laughs> between the time that people get there and start tailgating, which they might already be doing, and now to the to the game time at six o'clock. Yep. It's going to be a wild, wild atmosphere, and I hope it's worth every bit of those seven points. And, and like Quinn said, guys, Definitely. you know, like Quinn said, if you're going out there to do these uh, these events and you want to go to the game and you're out there tailgating. Like Quinn said, hydrate properly and wink, wink. You know what he's talking about. Uh, you don't <laughs> want to be too trashed when you go up in that stadium. We need you to be loud. We need you to be rowdy, but not too rowdy. Yep. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And, uh, you know, this is a massive game for Pittman and his program, probably bigger than it is for Texas because of where Arkansas has been and the lack of respect that they've had for so long. I mean, you know, even Sarkeesian, even though he's just a, a first-year coach, definitely has more clout than Sam Pittman has. This is a major, major statement opportunity for the Razorbacks to say, look, we're back. We're not the SEC doormat anymore. If you come to Fayetteville, you've got to come to play. Is this season lost without a, a Texas win, if, without no. beating Texas? No, it's not. It's not. But it goes a long way into – these big gaudy records that we were picking, right. you know, eight, nine, <laughs> that 10 plays wins. a big part in it. Yes. It <laughs> you does. need the four non-conference Absolutely really, does. really badly. Um, man, it's Texas week guys. I mean, this is, it's been awesome. Uh, so excited. Caitlin, like you said, I can't want, cannot wait to see the crowd. 
it's going to be on fire and it's and this is the new you know since we've had the added seats and everything so yep. there could be an actual new record set here and yep. uh i got a, there's a very good good chance that that is going to happen six o'clock game i mean it's perfect timing perfect even better than that alabama game timing back in 2010 because i know that was in the afternoon um so just uh can't cannot wait to see what happens can't wait to find out what we can talk about and uh you know on this show next week so that's all i got i need i need two tickets and uh (laughs) let's get it going (laughs) there you have it there you have it well tune in game time 6 p.m saturday uh, you'll definitely want to check that out and uh, stay tuned. And next week, we'll have more Razor Wire coming your way here from the Arkansas Sports Network as we bring you all the events that happened from this Saturday right here on the Razor Wire.